when the Sainsbury Centre was opened in 1978, I, I was confronted with works of art from all over the world, from prehistory to the present. I had uh, no knowledge to help me to deal with more than a fraction of them. I became interested in finding ways of studying art, which didn't mean you had to learn the language and read all the books about a particular place or particular artist. I found out a lot about the way the human brain is formed and using the principles that are, have been discovered by neuroscientists, I thought I could try and work out what were the factors that influenced any artist at any time in any place. I wanted a, a way into the minds of all makers and I wanted to find a way of of engaging with them. If people look at something very intensely, they're going to acquire visual preferences which are going to emerge in their work. The principles of neuroscience may provide a key to understanding those their particular visual preferences. If I now go through the Sainsbury Centre, I can see all sorts of ways in which they're the preferences of their makers can indeed be seen to be shaped by the experiences of those makers and patrons in their daily lives. My first contact with uh, Gerard Karras was when he wrote to me out of the blue uh, an email in, I think, March 2009 and asked if I might, would be interested in writing about his work. It had to do with trying to find answers to what I was doing and thinking. Curiosity to problems that developed in my mind which I had no answer to and uh, hit upon John. When Gerard sent me his photographs of geometrical abstractions, I couldn't relate it to anything that were in the environment of uh, somebody living in the late 20th century Netherlands. And uh, I was at a loss. He started this idea for the first time of a new field of investigation where not only uh, the art itself was explained, but where the art came from. What lies behind it? Anyway, he kept on badgering me, and eventually I wrote to him, and I said, one Friday, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to look at your work again over the weekend, and I'm going to uh, tell you on Monday whether I can do something. He became interested in my past experiences. And he was strengthened in what he later called experiential knowledge. That past experiences of a person who later becomes an artist may unconsciously get his hand many years later. If my principles are right, that if you know about somebody's neural formation, you can have an idea about why they had preferences for particular forms. I thought I must find a way of approaching it. John had not enough confidence in at that time starting to write about me. Until he hit upon an earlier picture that he had found in some catalogue. Where as a youngster already in the school, I was learning how to handle material. You can see that he is looking with an extraordinary intensity, a more than normal pleasure in his, his work. And it's fundamental to you know, really sort of neuroscience and fundamental to my use of neuroscience, that if you know 
what somebody has been looking at with particular intensity, you will have a better idea about what preferences have shaped their, their neural formation. He found out subsequently he had been become involved in the oil industry, engaged as an as a, as a oil worker with drilling rigs, drilling to the earth. He went on to construct a, a, a very remarkable steel structure, which was the antenna at Andover, Maine, put up in 1961 to receive the images from the first satellite transmitting TV images. I thought this actually looks like this work that I was puzzling over. And then I also googled the Telstar satellite, which was a satellite uh, whose signals the antenna was designed to receive. And I thought this looks like other things that he's made. If I, if I follow this line, I'll, I'll see how far I can get with explaining his uh, artistic development. John Steary tells him that a unconscious memory with my neurons made the hand draw through artists are admitting that what they're doing is not, not, not really what they're doing more than themselves. It comes from the instructions of their neurons. That's the new thing about it, which I think is beautiful. I knew that he lived in Maastricht and I knew that Maastricht is uh, the center of production of um, bathroom furniture, uh, laboratories, bidets and, and so on. And I saw these rows of bises and urinals, and I thought, my God, these also look like his work. It's possible that if he'd had any exposure to the um, artifacts produced in the um, Sphinx sanitary ceramics factory, these might also have affected him. I went on working on this, and uh, I said, I, I'll, I'll send you something by the end of the week. having made the observations which I've just referred to, in other words, noticing the similarities between the artifacts he'd been responsible for constructing. I sent it off on a Friday and I couldn't believe my uh, luck when on the Saturday morning he wrote back and he said, um, I'm, you've done me a real service. I'm, I'm extremely relieved. I, People have told me all my life that this is, uh, my art is all about abstraction and mathematics and geometry and Plato and philosophy. And uh, I just knew it was in me and it had to come out. And uh, you with your neuroart historical uh, exposition have shown where it comes from. The uh, uh, professors in art history don't buy that, as in fact they worked against it, because it is not really accepted just by the art historians. He wrote to me and he said, I, sh by the way, I should say that I do have some knowledge of the Sphinx factory because my grandfather worked there and there was a strike once and during which he, and during it he was able to show me round the factory. So in other words, he, he really accepted the, my proposition, which was that he um, had been profoundly affected, his neural formation was profoundly affected by particular objects or classes of objects. I subsequently uh, went to visit him in Maastricht. Yes. What is the result? What do you see here? That's why I left everything in the And confirmed my impression of him as being an, an individual who, who experienced life with uh, exceptional intensity. By the way, is this influenced by the double helix? Yes, yes of course. Of no, it's the only way around the double helix. You come to all of this. I was in front of this. Okay. I was making quasi crystals before the scientists even discovered it. Okay, okay. Danny Sachman in England got the prize. But who, if he felt something, he tried to express it uh, in, a, in a personal way. To make this. So if you get a shot of it, that you have this whole view, this is actually what my main topic, protagonism, is all about. He does stress that he invented 
a new style of art, which is called pentagonism, because he's the first artist to have exploited the form of the pentagon and regular solids, which exploit, the, which use the, the pentagon. Well, it merely shows. I don't, I cannot craft it either. When things fit together. He was interested in having found a form which had not been much used by artists and he felt that by exploiting the Pentagon he could add some a new dimension to the history of art. The written history of mankind in art is how long? How many thousands of years? Try to find in a history book this form. No, no, I agree. That's a, by the way, what is this made of? What is this made of? Well, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> Let me finish what I'm talking about. The form is not yeah. being known before Gerhard Kahn became interested in it. Yeah. And that in itself yeah, is, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. is unique. I don't conceive myself as being this or that. I'm seeing myself as a constant, changing my ideas according to knowledge and new visions that arrive in my head of which I select certain things to what has become my uh, preference, being an artist, with this one single form. His intensity I regard as being critical to his response to those visual experiences. Uh, arrangements of pentagons. So I started on my drawing table to make various drawings, which I gave you copies of, which you can see that uh, these are the copies I start making. There's three variations, number three variations thereof here, which I showed you and which you can... He remembered that during his professional life, which was uh, much of it was spent in Saudi Arabia and uh, on oil wells, that he spent a lot of time visiting mosques. So, uh, I had uh, well, my, my work uh, qualified as, as a new system, uh, namely a form given based upon the regular pentagon. So it was very surprising to me that uh, this uh, uh, imagination, as if it was my uh, first idea, here I find something from the Islamic world 500 years ago, which actually sh <laughs> was the originator of the first system. He did his own neuro art history and said, I think. I was influenced by looking at Islamic art. What my work was doing um, was looking at things of which he was not conscious. And I, I, I was very pleased that unlike some artists who say, they, I know why I did that and I know, what, don't you tell me what it is, it, he was very ready to accept the fact that what he was saying was only part of the story. Any architects take interest in your your designs for buildings? Well, again, here becomes the, the problem of architecture itself. If I go into this, I have I I stop working as an artist, really. And of course, I, I, what I'm saying I'm doesn't doesn't infringe his claims uh, for to be interested in the in the in the Pentagon and uh, to have developed a new uh, dimension to the to the history of art. It simply gives one some idea of what the sources of that interest might be. Some of the things that I'd said about his work, which he didn't like, like the reference to uh, the atomic bomb and uh, the allusion to training in the use of the bayonet, he clearly has thinks you know, maybe there's something there. At the end of the war, the Americans were advertising for people to join the American military and uh, clean the Japanese out of the Pacific. One of the things that I, I did was to follow this up and I, and I was saying how I thought that he may well have been influenced not just by the things that he'd been looking at but also by the things that he'd been doing what he'd done with the sharp point of his um, his his bayonet
I could see that they, they look, those, the painting, the nucleation paintings and the painting of, of radiation, to look like the international sign for warning. He, his senses that his work is more, more lethal than he thought it was. And the other thing that he confirmed, which I, I'd sensed from these, the latest series of rhombohedral uh, sculptures as incorporating elements from female genitalia, that he, he does genuinely see them that way. He sees his interest in female genitalia as having been nourished by his Californian experience because, uh, you know, free love, sexual encounters were clearly really important in Berkeley in, in the 60s. I'm interested in using neuroscience not to explain just why people in a particular place who've seen a particular landscape or a particular class of artifacts, why everybody in that environment is, uh, has preferences shaped by such exposure, but that you may have an individual who has a particular exposure to a particular object or a particular group of objects, and that this has uh, uh, an effect on the individual which is comparable to what a class of objects might have on a whole community. One of the principles of neuroscience which I have been most excited by is the importance that the repetition and intensity affect the quality of somebody's neural formation. And the more you, often you look at something and the more intensely you look at something, the more it's likely to affect your visual preferences. I could see from the way he talked that he would have experienced everything in his life with a greater vitality and a greater engagement than most people. In this gallery, I think they're very, they are very beautifully displayed, very beautifully lit very well hung and uh, they make an impact. One of my most compelling reactions to the show that that the works have a sort of an urgency and an edginess which they didn't seem to have to me when I saw them as photographs. In the case of somebody like Hayat who is who has this, this, this uh, an intensity affecting all aspects of his life. His neural resources would have been more profoundly affected by his experiences than most people are. Most people don't look um, with an intensity which is enough to fear fundamentally reconfigure the resources. He, he, he was, I think, uh, liable to be affected very powerfully. This has an important consequences for the quality of his work. I give volume to it. And as he was not part of a herd or a fashion, it helps to understand why he's, he hasn't had an easy life as an artist. But it does explain, I think, why his art is exceptionally powerful to, to this day. This excites me no end. <laughs> I'm excited by, by what it really means to be a, a creature of a family <laughs> that seems to uh, evolve into all of this greatness and get closer and closer every day to these new discoveries.